In 1970, a television program debuted that changed the way millions of people looked at faith. The Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Featuring the ministry of Robert Schuler, taught a generation that through God's love, your scars can be turned into stars. It was an idea that launched the most popular inspirational television program of its time. And today, the Hour of Power continues with a new voice for a new generation. When you put your trust in God, nothing can stop you. Pastor Bobby Schuler will encourage you and share a message that can give you a new perspective on life. Because whatever your circumstance or the obstacles you face, this moment can be your Hour of Power. Today is the day God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is that time of year. I hope you're not too stressed out. I hope you're still having fun. And uh, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning at Shepherd's Grove. We're so happy to have with us the Albert McNeil Jubilee Choir with us this morning. We're so glad to have you here. Love you guys. Would you turn around to those who are standing next to you, greet them in the name of the Lord and say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we are trusting you during this Christmas season that in the midst of all of the hurry and the rushing and the shopping, that we would never forget your presence. Lord, we thank you that you were born on a dark, cold night in a feeding trough, that that was where the king of the universe made his grand debut. We trust in you, Jesus. Our souls are shepherded by you, and that means we can slow down and be happy and live in your peace. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. Now please listen as we read Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem was disturbed. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Albert McNeil Jubilee Singers. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning, inspiring us. Uh, they'll be on the plaza this morning if you'd like to talk to them. Uh, I don't know, do you give autographs? Okay. This morning, I am happy to welcome to Shepherd's Grove and the Hour of Power, Barbara Johnson Witcher. Barbara, who is a proud mother, grandmother, and a great grandmother, is also known in her field as a dynamic businesswoman, broadcaster, author, and speaker. After publishing two nonfiction business books, she realized her lifelong dream to publish a Christian, uh, Christian book. Over the past year, her dream was realized when The Christmas Chapel was published, a great holiday book about God's special miracles. She also has a wonderful attachment to the Hour of Power. Would you please welcome with me Barbara Johnson Witcher. Hi, 
Barbara. Gosh, I'm so glad you're here with us today. And we talked a little uh, briefly uh, in the back before we came, and you mentioned just how our power oh. has impacted your own life. Well, it certainly has. I wouldn't be here without the hour of power. Um, I married my beloved husband 37 years ago, and he's been with, with God in heaven for the last 10. But when I married him, I had been raised in a traditional church that didn't talk about Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And he was a born-again Christian. And so I said to him when we got married, now I want nothing to do with all this Jesus stuff. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay, but you know what? There's a really good television show on every Sunday morning, and it's very full of positive thinking, and you're in sales management, and you need positive thinking, and I think you'd like it. And I said, well, all right, I'll watch a television show. Well, of course, it was the hour of power yeah. with your grandfather. Sure, yeah. And besides positive thinking, he also, of course, brought in a lot of Christ, and eventually I did become a believer in Christ, and so here I am. That's great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. You know, that was, his, that was his method, you know, and a lot of evangelicals have criticized my grandfather in the past because he didn't preach the Bible enough or he wasn't hardcore enough about some of these, like, you know, do deep doctrinal elements, but... He said once to me that, you know, that you plant the seeds, there's some people that plant the seeds, there's some people that, you know, fertilize the seeds, there's some people that harvest, and then there's some people that till the ground. And he said, that's me, I till the ground. So that's great. He's uh, someone who gets the ground ready to receive the word well, of God. Well, I would never have watched it if it had been all that type of preaching. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wonderful. So he was, he says that he was a missionary, and I agree he with was. him. So, so part of your formation then from Hour of Power and other places then inspired you to pursue your dream, which was writing this book, The Christmas Chapel. That so is correct. Tell me a little bit about the book. Well, The Christmas Chapel is about a, a blizzard in my fictional town of New Stockford on December 23rd. Nothing can get in and out, no traffic. And um, the, the little chapel that had been closed for two years is opened by the caretaker because he felt people needed to come in for shelter, and they did. Eight people came in, and they couldn't use their cell phones, they couldn't use their computers, no technology was working in that blizzard, and they just sat there and amidst the stained glass windows of Christ's life and listening to hymns on, you know, played on the organ, and they heard the voice of God talking to them about their life, and every one of them had a special problem that we have today, frustration, bitterness, you know, whatever it might be, unemployment, and God, with seven of them, makes a complete attitude adjustment. The eighth person, uh, there is a big conflict between good and evil, and he doesn't make an attitude adjustment. But there will be another book coming out after this one that takes the people from, from where they leave on the 24th to what happens with their life. But the Christmas chapel is really about listening to God and having the miracles of him coming into your life. Wonderful. And I, I'm sort of hearing from you that, I mean, is there, is there a sort of a critique involved then within this message about what our lives are like during the Christmas season? Well, and yes, because it's always so chaotic. You know, we, we've got tons of things on our to-do list and everything yeah. is noisy and confusing. And if there's one message that, that we get out of the Christmas uh, chapel, and I hope there's, there's more, but there's one that I really want everyone to understand, is be still and know that I am God take time every day, no matter how busy we are, and we are, to just be quiet, open our Bibles, just talk to him like he was your best friend, because he is, and let him talk to you about your life. Mm, that's wonderful. He does yeah. make a difference. Today <laughs> is a Sunday of peace, you know, so that seems to go just right along with kind of what you're saying, you know, that sure you kind of have God forcing these people to slow down and hear his voice and, and receive his peace. So that's a wonderful message. Great. Thank you. Your granddaughter's here today, oh, right? She is. She is. Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn. Madeline, nice. Madeline. Oh, Madeline. I'm sorry. Hi, Madeline. Nice to see you. Madeline is... <laughs> Madeline is my firstborn of eight granddaughters. And she is a graphic artist. And I asked her to design the cover of this book as well as the other one I have out. And she did an amazing job. I'm so proud of her. But of course, I am a grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, great. Well, you know, um, there are so many people listening to you today. And um, we have millions, or 11 international offices around the world. And, wow. and they're all going, you know, they're all celebrating Christmas together. And they're all in that hectic season that you were talking about. And obviously, when you write a book, you, there's a lot of reflection. But here in this Christmas season, what would you say to the sea of people that are listening? If you had one thing to say, what would you tell them? Well, Christmas is always the time of miracles and it's of dreams. And I know there are people 
here as well as watching you on television that had a dream when they were young and then life got in the way and they put that dream on the shelf. Well, it's time to take that dream off the shelf and dust it off and revisit it. If I can do it at 73, my children would tell me, would tell you I'm an absolute antique, and I guess I am. But if my dreams can come true, yours can. So go for that dream because that's what it's really all about. Wonderful. And that's, of course, the message that sucked you into the hour of Absolutely. power. Absolutely. <laughs> it sounds like something your grandfather would yeah, say. Yeah, <laughs> great. Awesome. Well, Barbara, we're so glad that you came today, and we're so happy that you, you uh, wrote this great book, and uh, we look forward to reading it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank and, you. Thank um, you. The book is the book is the Christmas Chapel, and uh, Barbara, you'll be on the uh, I will as a signing afterwards. So certainly, th thanks again. Thank and you. We love you. As 2015 comes to a close, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you who regularly support this program. Your prayers and gifts have meant the world to us, and we just can't say thank you enough. This year, your generous support helped us expand this program into new television markets, reaching more people who need to hear the positive message of Jesus Christ. And as we move into 2016, we'll add even more outlets for people to hear about God's love for them. Now, as we close out the year, we're excited to offer you a deluxe Hour of Power edition of my newest book, Happiness According to Jesus. It's a book about how the Sermon on the Mount and the wisdom of Jesus is what brings us into the full, rich life that we all desperately want. 
I'm so passionate about this book that when you request your copy, I'll personally sign it for you. Or even taking it a step further, when you give us your request for this book, include a prayer request or a specific moment when you felt happy or blessed, and your book will include a Bible verse selected just for you by the Hour of Power staff. You know, we receive letters, phone calls, and emails every day from people who are finding hope, rebuilding their families, or overcoming addiction or depression. Whether you're Janet from Denver or Mike from Sacramento, we want to hear from you. We want to pray for you, and we want to help you in your faith walk. Friends, thank you for supporting this program. Your gifts, prayers, and words of encouragement mean the world, and we couldn't do it without you. Thank you, and remember always, God loves you, and so do we. As a thank you for your year-end support, we're pleased to offer a deluxe Hour of Power edition of Pastor Bobby's newest book, Happiness According to Jesus. We are offering the deluxe book for your tax-deductible donation of $60. This includes the book and a personally inscribed autograph by Pastor Bobby. So call, write, or go online and request your copy today. For your gift of $100, we'll not only send you Pastor Bobby's autographed book, Happiness According to Jesus, We'll also include a set of two beautifully designed porcelain mugs, each imprinted with an inspiring quote from the book, Do Good, Bless Others, and Prayer is Letting Go. Your gifts help the Hour of Power stay on the air and make a positive difference to viewers around the world. We can't do it without you, so please write, call, or go online with your gift today.
Wonderful. In this season, we wanted to reflect on Advent. And Advent is this word that means the coming, or maybe more romantic is the arrival. The arrival. The arrival of the Messiah, the Son of God, the one everyone was waiting for in Israel. That's what we celebrate when we celebrate Christmas. But then to sort of be in partnership with the narrative or the story that precedes the birth of Christ, we have this sort of little four-week period where we ourselves prepare our own hearts for the arrival of Christ in our darkness. So the motif that we will be following in, in, in this Christmas season then is this idea that there are all these characters that are on these dangerous roads in the Christmas story, you know, to come to this one central place where Jesus is going to be born. And that although they're traveling in an ancient Near Eastern world that can be dangerous and cold and very uncomfortable and uh, unpredictable, that still they keep the birth of Christ before their minds. And that hope guides them through the darkness. So then the reflection for our own heart this Advent season then is keep Christ before your mind. When you are in the dark road, when you're, the road of your life seems cold and dangerous, many of you this season have had terrible things happen. I know that we've had lots of people that are sick, people who have lost loved ones. Some of you, this will be the first Christmas without that one person and so many of you are suffering, you're in pain. Uh, you, it feels like the road that you're on has become increasingly dark and increasingly colder. And the reflection this Advent for, for that person, you who are suffering, who are hurting, who are in the dark night of your soul, I say to you, keep Christ before your mind as you travel. And you will see the glory of the Lord shine in your darkness. The four words that we meditate on in this season of Advent are hope, then peace, then joy, then love, then on Christmas Eve we light the Christ candle. And that is on purpose because hope gives birth to peace. Peace gives birth to joy. 
then that true joy gives birth to real unconditional love. And when that happens, Christ is alive in you. Amen? Wonderful. We're talking about peace in the midst of all of the craziness of life. The most important spiritual thinker and writer of my lifetime was a man named Dallas Willard, my mentor and good friend, and he passed away uh, this year. But Dallas left an incredible legacy of what it means to be a disciple, walking in the kingdom of God in the easy yoke of Jesus. Um, Dallas was the kind of person that allowed anyone to come into his office. He, he had several, several students. He would put his writing aside and would spend hours sometimes with people, just giving them time, listening to them, and praying for them. Dallas was somebody that when you met him, you're like, this is somebody who knows Jesus. This man and Jesus are buddies. They hang out together. Like, he knows Jesus. And, uh, and, and one such person who, who had the privilege of talking with Dallas Willard was a, an, another good friend of mine and member of our church, Bill Gaultier. And Bill was walking with Dallas one time, and they were talking and meditating on certain things. And, and Dallas stopped Bill and he said, Bill, if you could give one word to describe Jesus what would that one word be? And Bill thought, wow, if I had to pick one word to describe Jesus, he thought, loving, all-powerful, forgiving, sacrificial, Lord, right? All of these words come to mind, these things we think of that, that describe Jesus. And Dallas said, I'll tell you what my word is. And when I heard this word, I couldn't stop thinking about it for weeks. For weeks, every day, like every couple of hours, I thought about this was the word that the greatest spiritual giant I've ever known gave to Jesus. This word was, was the one that he felt like was the one word that described Jesus. You know what the word was? You're going to have to wait. I'll tell you on that. <laughs> Bazing. That's how I keep you listening. Today I want to read, I'll tell you, don't worry, I'll get there. <laughs> Today I want to read from Isaiah chapter 9, which is sort of, was already famous, but made especially famous in Handel's Messiah. A prophecy of the coming of the Messiah and who this Messiah would be. Now, when Isaiah made this prophecy, it was just after King Uzziah had died. That was when he received his calling in chapter 6. And Israel was broken into two kingdoms, the northern, which was called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was called Judah. And it was a very tumultuous time, and they were on the brink of actually the Babylonian exile in Scripture. They were surrounded by the most evil empire in human history. Think of all of the villains you can think of in history. Nobody was worse than the Assyrians. The Assyrians did things that were so awful and inhumane for thousands of years they were so bad, I can't even mention them from the pulpit. If you've ever seen a, a crazy horror movie from the 80s, that's what the Assyrians did to people. And in Judah, where Jerusalem is and all, all of this, where Isaiah is prophesying from, they are surrounded by this enemy that is ruthless and is truly the essence of evil. And into this, Isaiah prophesies in the midst of this, this tumult and this danger and unrest, Isaiah prophesies that not a great warrior, but a child will be born and he will be the Messiah. Now, before this happens, King Uzziah breaks a, like a big thing, you're not, a big rule you're not supposed to break. Uzziah was a great king, but he decided he wanted to be a priest also, and that was something he didn't do. We might say they had, it was an early version in Judaism of separation between church and state. Kings weren't priests and priests weren't kings. And one day Uzziah decides that he wants to become also not just the high king, but the high priest. He enters into the temple. He wants to light the incense. And all of a sudden he's stricken with leprosy. The priests drag him out. And 10 years later, he dies. And almost in response to this, then, there, this prophecy is given. Because they said only one, there will only be one who will unite 
both the kingdom and the priesthood. Only one. And this is the Messiah. And you, Uzziah, are not him. And that's what this prophecy is about. It's about Jesus, who united both the kingdom and the priesthood. And it says, for unto us a child is born. I'm having trouble not singing it in a rhythm. For unto us a child is born. <laughs> I'll do my best. I'll hang in there. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. <laughs> and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there shall be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that day on and forevermore. These names that are given to Jesus, we believe as Christians, are messianic. It's the idea that someday a Messiah will come and he will be both the king and the priest and he will be wonderful counselor, mighty God, and for, for Jew, uh, you know, Jewish people to give this name to a king, mighty God, everlasting father. And then finally, and the most important one, what's the last one? The Prince of Peace. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> There's no Messiah this year, but uh, next time, we'll see. I can't resist that, right? Sorry. So. No, the, the, uh, the, uh, the idea here then is that a king and a priest is coming to reign over Israel. How do we read this passage then as Christians? We believe that this king did come and he came as a child, as it says in the passage. And he is the wonderful counselor and a mighty God and the prince of peace. He inaugurated what we call the kingdom of God. And as Christians, the way we, re we read Isaiah is that not only is this king going to bring peace to Israel, but he's going to bring peace to the whole world, which includes you and me. All of us, in our own little ways, are kings, and all of us are queens, and all of us have our own little kingdoms and queendoms. I don't know if queendom is a word. <laughs> And that means that essentially I have things in my life, I have things in my life that I am lord over. My car, I lord over, that's my car, you know? You do not leave your stuff in my car. <laughs> you know, we, we have things and rules and stuff that we control, and some of us control more things than other things. And in Christianity, we believe that the kingdom of God means that I take the crown off of my head, which rules all these little things in my life, and I lay it before the throne of the Prince of Peace. I am not a Prince of Peace. I am a Prince of hurry, of worry, of competition, of control, of gossip, of deception. Huh? And to become a believer means that that man is put to death. That there is regicide. That I die. And that my crown then is taken from my head and laid before the throne of Jesus. And I say, Jesus, I am the prince of violence, but you are the prince of peace. And I want you to reign over my life. And that means I surrender. I wave the white flag to you. I'm going to let go. And Jesus puts his arm around and says, I will guide you and I will help you. He's the Prince of Peace, which means when he reigns over your life, peace should reign over your life. It means that you no longer insist on your way, but you insist on his way in your life. That everything that is in my life that is different than what Jesus would do changes. I think in terms of how would my life be different 
If Jesus Christ were leading this life, in my case, if Jesus Christ were a 32-year-old husband, father of two, pastor of a church in Southern California, how would he lead that life? That's the most important question I can ask as a disciple and a student of Jesus. And so this Christmas and today we reflect on, is the kingdom of Bobby, has it surrendered to the Prince of Peace? Is there real peace in my life? So Bill and Dallas are walking along and Dallas says, Bill, you know what my one word is? You know what the one word was? In my mind, the greatest spiritual thinker, writer, and disciple I have ever known in my lifetime? Relaxed. You knew that if you read my column in the newspaper last week, I suppose. Relaxed. Oh, I don't know, relaxed? Come on. All right, some of you are thinking relaxed. Think about it. Jesus, you know, there were lots of people that Jesus didn't heal and lots of people that Jesus didn't teach, and yet he continued to sort of walk along and continued to go. Lazarus is dying. This is one of Jesus' closest friends. He's in Jesus' sort of inner circle. Lazarus is dying, and he decides to just take his time because he knows that the Father's going to just raise him from the dead. You know, there, there are times, for example, when Jesus casts a demon out of some man and throws it into these swine and this, you know, this whole economy goes over a cliff and this mob wants to kill him and he just slips out somehow. Jesus, in his life, knows that eventually he's going to be tortured and murdered in one of the worst ways known in his contemporary day, that he's going to be beaten, whipped, and suffocate to death. And he knows that in that same moment, he's going to take not only the sins of one person, but the sin of every single human being, past, present, and future, in one moment, so that his heart is tortured, his heart and soul is tortured. He knows that's coming. And Jesus is relaxed. Jesus took a nap in a storm on a boat. Jesus was, was relaxed. He was unhurried. He was walking in the easy rhythms of grace. You know, the two things that may contradict the sort of image of relaxed Jesus are the temple and Gethsemane, huh? Like, we think of the temple when Jesus goes in with his whip and he turns the tables over. But, you know, Jesus, like, took some time to make this whip thing. And when he went in and knocked over tables, this was something that prophets kind of did in the Near East. They made these big dramatic displays to show what really matters to them. We don't want to think about Jesus like he was so enraged and so angry that he just flew in there and he was shouting and... That's not how we think of the story of Jesus. It's not the right way to think about Jesus. In fact, I think what Jesus did was calculate it. And I think it was done with re real reflection and thought. And you could even say that kicking the money changers' tables over was an act of love. That he wanted to rescue them into God's kingdom. And think about what is the very first thing Jesus does in the temple after he does that. He starts healing people. And I might add in a very relaxed way. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying and he knows the cross is coming and he's sweating drops of blood, uh, it's possible that Satan was even trying to kill Jesus in that moment. But he knew what was about to come, and I believe that the Lord was preparing him, that a great spiritual battle was happening. So obviously, in our lives, there will be times of great intensity, like Jesus experienced in Gethsemane. But what happened after Jesus finishes that prayer and he enters then into the passion of the cross? He is relaxed. Immediately after the prayer at Gethsemane, he is relaxed. He's about to be arrested. And they say, "Who? we are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Who is he? And Jesus almost kind of says, I am. He doesn't say, I am he. He says, I am, which is the name of God. And everybody falls down. Boom. And you just kind of get this picture of her. And, and Peter tries to cut off, you know, he cuts off one of the soldiers here and he says, no, Peter, no, you know. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword and just kind of puts the ear back on the man's head. And then we see him quietly facing Herod, 
quietly facing uh, uh, Pontius Pilate. And he, he goes through the passion in a slow and unhurried uh, way that is, that is phenomenal. Jesus was relaxed. And Jesus was, and this is even more interesting, was interruptible. I think, am I interruptible? I think about it. When he's on his way, he's constantly being interrupted. Whether, like, he's on his way to go heal Jairus' daughter, and there's this bleeding woman that needs healing, and so he stops and he heals her, and then he goes on his way. The children, you know, we're not supposed to talk, uh, talk to great prophets. He said, no, let the children come to me. Jesus was constantly being interrupted, and he was able to be interrupted because he was relaxed. And Jesus was relaxed because he was in tune with the heartbeat of the Father, and the Father's heart beat for Jesus. And that's the thing you need to hear more than anything, is that Jesus wasn't relaxed just out of willpower. But Jesus was completely in tune with the heartbeat of God. And the heartbeat of God was a deep, abiding, perfect love for Jesus. He knew that in his baptism when the Father said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And did you know that in the same way God's heart beat for Jesus, it beats for you? God loved Jesus and loves Jesus. And did you know he loves you just as much as he loves Jesus? God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. God loves you as much as he loved Paul. God loves you as much as he loved Mary. God loves you as much as he loved Moses and Abraham and all the spiritual heroes and super pastors that you know in your life. God loves you and values you and treasures you and has just as an important plan for your life as he did for Jesus. And that truth, that, that, that truth, if we internalize it, gives us the ability to just chill out, to just relax and to just walk in the easy, unhurried, unworried rhythms of God's good grace. And that's something we can be thankful for. That means we can be people of peace. Jesus was at peace constantly because he walked in the loving passion and arms of his Father. And that's what made him the Prince of Peace. And then we get to Christmas. And we celebrate the birth of this Prince of Peace, don't we? We celebrate his birth by running to the front of lines for sales, uh, by getting in fights in parking lots, uh, by going into debt, uh, by packing our schedule with endless uh, events and errands. And we speed up, we get faster, we get in a hurry, we spend all our money, we get competitive. How is the way in which we celebrate Christmas at odds with Jesus himself, who was the relaxed, unhurried prince of peace? We live in a society in which people are constantly worried, worried about the future, worried about, am I going to pay my bills, worried about my children, worried about my parents, worried about my job, worried if I'm going to get there on time, worried if I'm going to get enough sleep tonight. We take pills to fall asleep and we drink coffee to wake up. We're in a hurry, we're worried, we're restless, we're insatiable. Everything is hurried. Eating, driving, sex, holidays, vacations. Sorry, I said sex. <laughs> we are constantly in a hurry. Everything we do is fast and, and frantic. And, and if you hurry through life, you're just going to get to the end faster. Hurrying and worrying for some of us feels normal. Where if we don't hurry, if we don't worry, we feel as though we're being irresponsible. Or maybe we feel a little bit bored. And so immediately we want to hurry and worry again because that feels somehow normal again. That feels safe. That's not the kind of life that God has called us to. God has called us like Jesus, to surrender to his love. To actually have the audacity to believe that even when people you love have died, even if you've lost everything, 
Even if you're angry at your government or your school or your job or your traffic or your stupid car or whatever it is, that in the midst of that, you just trust God. You, you trust God so much that it almost feels crazy. There is actually an invitation to experience the depth and richness of God's love in such a way that you just stop worrying. How do you walk with God as a believer? This was said by a disciple years ago. You walk with God at a walking pace. If we want to be people who live in the easy rhythms of God, we need to become people that daily meditate and receive God's love and do it in a way that is slow and is unhurried and is unworried and says, God, even in the midst of really painful times, I trust you. I trust your love for me. I trust your favor. I'm not going to worry anymore. I'm not going to hurry. And so I say to you, slow down. Don't worry. And let go. Slow down. Don't worry. Let go. God is involved in your life. He is not surprised by the horrible things that have happened to you, even though he hates them. God is involved with every moment of your life. When you sleep, he is there with you. When you rise, he is watching you. Every event in your life, he knows and is in partnership with your pain and is in partnership with your joy. And you can trust him. You are a lot safer than you think. So don't worry. Don't hurry. Slow down. Let go and allow yourself to just fall back into the embrace and loving arms of the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Lord God, you loved us first. And that first love is a love that cannot be taken, cannot be earned, it cannot be tampered with. It's not surprised, it knows all, and it still loves. We entrust our souls to you, Jesus. We thank you that you are shepherding us through the darkness. There is no fog too thick for you. There is no darkness too dim for you. You are the light of our souls. We hold your hand and we trust you. You love us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merry Christmas. As 2015 comes to a close, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you who regularly support this program. Your prayers and gifts have meant the world to us, and we just can't say thank you enough. This year, your generous support helped us expand this program into new television markets, reaching more people who need to hear the positive message of Jesus Christ. And as we move into 2016, we'll add even more outlets for people to hear about God's love for them. Now, as we close out the year, we're excited to offer you a deluxe Hour of Power edition of my newest book, Happiness According to Jesus. 
It's a book about how the Sermon on the Mount and the wisdom of Jesus is what brings us into the full, rich life that we all desperately want. I'm so passionate about this book that when you request your copy, I'll personally sign it for you. Or even taking it a step further, when you give us your request for this book, include a prayer request or a specific moment when you felt happy or blessed, and your book will include a Bible verse selected just for you by the Hour of Power staff. You know, we receive letters, phone calls, and emails every day from people who are finding hope, rebuilding their families, or overcoming addiction or depression. Whether you're Janet from Denver or Mike from Sacramento, we want to hear from you. We want to pray for you, and we want to help you in your faith walk. Friends, thank you for supporting this program. Your gifts, prayers, and words of encouragement mean the world, and we couldn't do it without you. Thank you, and remember always, God loves you, and so do we. As a thank you for your year-end support, we're pleased to offer a deluxe Hour of Power edition of Pastor Bobby's newest book, Happiness According to Jesus. We are offering the deluxe book for your tax-deductible donation of $60. This includes the book and a personally inscribed autograph by Pastor Bobby. So call, write, or go online and request your copy today. For your gift of $100, we'll not only send you Pastor Bobby's autograph book, Happiness According to Jesus, We'll also include a set of two beautifully designed porcelain mugs, each imprinted with an inspiring quote from the book, Do Good, Bless Others, and Prayer is Letting Go. Your gifts help the Hour of Power stay on the air and make a positive difference to viewers around the world. We can't do it without you, so please write, call, or go online with your gift today. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And when you visit our website, you'll discover books, devotionals, and other resources to take your Christian life to a new level. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. And when you do, consider supporting this incredible ministry on a regular monthly basis. We're taking a life-changing message literally around the world and your regular financial support makes all the difference. Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future.